Hi there and welcome to Naturally Recovering Autism. I am your host, Karen Thomas, and I wanna thank you so much for being here and being a proactive parent and getting the resources that you need to let your child live their most fulfilling and independent life possible. When my own son was diagnosed with autism, I was told to drug him and try behavioral therapies and there was nothing else that we could do for him but manage his symptoms the rest of his life. But I didn't wanna do that. Fortunately, my background in craniosacral therapy of now 30 years, let me know that the brain can and does heal, but I didn't know that much about autism. What I did know is that I didn't want to just mask the symptoms with dangerous drugs. I wanted to find the causes and work with them naturally. And fast forward, it took me a decade and a lot of time and effort, but today my son is no longer diagnosable with autism after being told it could not happen. So I'm here to share with you valuable resources to, to save you the time and some of the expense that I had to spend to figure it out and to help you let your child lead to their best results possible. Every child's level of recovery is different, but we know that children who couldn't sleep through the night are sleeping now through the night and happily. Their immune systems are now strong where they were once sick all the time. Children who were nonverbal and their parents were told they could never speak are now speaking. Children who were getting D's and F's in school are getting A's and B's. And those that were so anxious all the time and couldn't sit still and, and were uncomfortable in their own bodies are now calm and happy and relaxed. And they're leading fulfilling and independent lives with friends. This is what we want for our kids. So I'm here to share the resources with you so that you can get the best results for your child the best possible. And you can start that right now with my free download of this top seven foods to eliminate beginning today of the top foods that are the most inflammatory and toxic that are contributing to those physical and behavioral symptoms of autism that your child is having. They're making his life uncomfortable. So you can get that right now at naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash seven foods and feel free to share that with anybody you know who would be interested. And I will also link to it in today's show notes. There's of course a lot more than diet, but this is something you could start doing today that will begin to reduce those symptoms. And I'm happy to share everything I can with you. So right now, let's dive into today's episode. Before we get begin, I just wanted to give a slight clarification that a couple of times in this episode, I made a reference to the link being episode number 163, and this is episode number 162. So the show notes for today's episode will be at naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash 162. Okay, enjoy the episode. Hi there, and welcome back. Uh, before we begin today, if I could ask you one favor, I would really appreciate. It takes a lot of time and effort and research to do these podcasts and to get them out and broadcasted to you. If you could go on iTunes and leave me, if you choose a five-star review and share it with anybody that you know on your social media or anywhere to let others know that this exists, it would really help to promote it and also help give these valuable resources to more people that need to know about them. So if you can do that for me real quick, I would really appreciate it. Today, we're going to be talking about some weight. And uh, this is, yes, weight on the body seven things you must know to lose weight. There are a lot of issues around diet that people are very unfamiliar with. And so I thought it would be important to go over them because we often look at weight at, or weight loss or overweight as you know more of an aesthetic piece. People are looking at you, you feel uncomfortable about it. Or if your child gains weight, they might have a big Buddha belly, at, you know, as it's called, or something like that where they're, you know, or they're really, really skinny and can't gain weight. And so there are a couple of things that are important to know that are related to health. This is more about health than anything else. Of course, if you're really overweight, it's actually that that fat in your body can actually be strangling some of your internal organs, your liver, your heart, that fat is wrapped around them and making it harder for them to work. There's also pieces like candida overgrowth that exists in the body that really makes it harder for us to lose weight. And I'll go into a few of those pieces today in this episode as well to help understand why 
but I'm going to go through these seven pieces because they really feed one feeds on top of another. And they all, you know, as you know, I'm all about the causes, not just kind of masking a symptom, find out what is an underlying issue that is something that you could actually work with. And what are some natural solutions? Because first of all, we need to know what might really be going on. What is more of the cause? So losing weight really has far greater challenges that people aren't aware of. There are some, again, underlying issues and mothers, especially of children on the autism spectrum or for themselves might be having trouble losing weight and not really knowing why. And this difficulty really can be combined factors beginning with diet, high in sugars and starchy carbohydrates, of course, but other factors are con contributing. You know, stress is of course a factor and I want to make sure that I mention that the mold biotoxins are one because mold is so important. If you don't eradicate it from your home and get it out of your and your child's life, it's causing a lot of health issues. And these are multiple system health issues. It's affecting not only your child's brain or your brain as well, and the inflammation, it's also causing your body's hormone levels to be off. So it's making it so you can't lose weight. So mold is really, really important, those mold biotoxin issues. And it's a big factor when working with autism that's often overlooked. It can also keep your gut ill by, by disrupting the lining in the gut and uh, not only inflaming it, but actually making it so weak that holes uh, can, be, uh, can be created, which can allow undigested food into the bloodstream then it causes acquired al allergies because the immune system begins responding to them. And it also then uh, is causing a lot of, of health issues because it's, it's putting those toxins into the blood. So let's go through some of these checklists because healthy weight also can be a challenge for children on the autism spectrum. And again, for anybody, these mold biotoxin issues are a big deal. And you've heard me do episodes in the past on mold and I'll link to uh, a link to one of those here for you today in, in the show notes, which will be at naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash 163. And uh, if you're you know exercising and you think you're eating okay, but you still can't lose weight, there are seven pieces that you can look at. And one of them is something called metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is an imbalance in your metabolism. It means that the blood sugar levels can't stabilize and it causes a myriad of other health issues in the body. The imbalances can lead to type two diabetes. Metabolic syndrome is usually caused by a diet high in sugar and bad fats, corn, safflower, sunflower, peanut, canola, and soybean oils are all some of those really bad fats. And yes, I did say canola. Canola oil is definitely a bad fat. It's been marketed to the masses to make us believe it's a healthy fat, and it is very much not so. So that's uh, important for you to just remember. And they add it to a lot of things like salad dressings and other things that you might not be suspicious of. So it's always, always good to read your labels. And it can be inherited in utero from your mother's eating habits, this metabolic syndrome. So it should be noted also that things like monosodium and glutamate or MSG, which is a flavor enhancer, is added to many foods and it's toxic to the brain and contributes to obesity. The same is true for the artificial sweetener aspartame, which is found in many food and beverage items labeled as diet. And these, it's important to know that aspartame and monosodium glutamate, MSG, are also excitotoxins. They literally excite your brain cells to death. And MSG is also known to cause extreme anger issues. So be sure that your foods and the foods that you purchase do not contain any of these. And I will give you some other solutions for some healthier versions of uh, natural sweeteners that are okay. First, I'm going to go through the top seven pieces that I wanted you to talk about to, with you today. And then I'll give you some solutions near the end too. So stick with me. Um, and additionally, when the, the body has multiple toxins to remove, the liver becomes congested. 
Now you've heard me do episodes on the liver as well, because the liver is the organ, the main organ of detoxification. So we have to support the liver and those detox pathways in order to even really start the, you know, the whole detoxification process. And it's all backed up. So that can cause problems with, with other uh, issues in the body. One thing I wanted to mention is the omega-3 fatty acid, uh, which is called known as DHA. It reduces the risk of metabolic syndrome, and it also happens to be a mood stabilizer. So as long as your child's okay with fats, because you want to start out slowly with fats, even good ones, uh, which I will tell you what the good ones are today too. Uh, but when, when you start out with fats, just start with your child with autism, especially with just smaller levels and work up and watch them for if there's any nausea after eating, that is usually a symptom of gallbladder uh, overload. And the gallbladder and the liver work closely together. So if the liver is congested, which it is in children with autism, and in many of us actually, then it can, can lean over into the gallbladder, weakening the gallbladder. And our gallbladder is our organ uh, that helps us really digest fats. So if you're starting to eat fats and noticing you're feeling nauseous after you eat or your child is, then that's an indication of gallbladder backing up, which again, if we support the, uh, the liver, then uh, it helps to support the gallbladder. Um, and I'll link to uh, some things that can help you uh, know for a good source of an omega-3 fatty acid, uh, the DHA, um, because it also is known to reverse insulin resistance. And uh, it's known to reduce stomach fat, decrease inflammation, and it's a necessary component of brain health. So it protects uh, the brain and it helps to function better. So now we're into liver congestion. Most children, again, on the autism spectrum are even born with a congested liver. And most adults have one as well. So a child will often get a lot of the mom's mother's toxins in utero or anything the mother is inhaling uh, while she is pregnant, that, that can also start to congest the liver of the, the fetus while it's before it's even born. So often our kids today, especially as you know, our world is very toxic that, um, you know, and I'm a huge proponent of making sure you detoxify every day, not just your child with autism, but all of us, because we need to stay on top of it for prevention. If the liver can't remove the toxins quickly enough, then it can't do its job of helping to remove excess hormones and keep hormones in balance. Yes, hormone levels are balanced by the liver. If you have a lot of hormone issues, it can be a liver issue. And as I mentioned, mold is very much involved in hormonal imbalances as well. So these are two things to look into if you have hormone issues and hormone imbalances can definitely cause issues with weight. Uh, the amount of hormone issues a person has often correlate to the health of their liver. Insulin is a hormone and insulin allows our body cells to absorb glucose or sugar from our blood. And glucose stops the body from using fat as energy. So a congested liver and fat deposits around this organ cause the liver to become insulin resistant. This causes the body to produce more glucose, raising blood sugar levels, and further increases insulin resistance. To further aggravate the situation, once all sugar stores are used up from the liver, your cells will begin to break down protein from your muscles and bones to burn as sugar because your body has to have some in it. In this case, you must reverse this process and retrain your body to burn fat. And I will talk about uh, that as leptin resistance in just a moment. But first, I want to address adrenals and thyroid imbalance. Now, the vicious glucose cycle triggers the stress response on the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands release the two stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. A release of these hormones triggers a spike in blood sugar and eventually trains your body to continue burning sugar instead of fat. This constant stress response overworks the adrenal glands and causes extreme fatigue. So eating sugar also triggers that stress response, and then weak adrenals lead to a poor functioning thyroid gland, 
which also reduces the body's ability to lose weight. So if you've got a lot of stress or taxed adrenal glands, it's going to then lean on the thyroid. And so adrenals and thyroid go hand in hand. It's really important to, to understand that. And our kids, especially since they have uh, so much toxicity, you know, we always just think of internal stress being stress from uh, from a factor of, of, of emotional stress, which of course is a big deal, but toxic uh, bodies and toxins in the system are heavy stressors on the body and inflammation, which our kids and many of us have inflammation as well, is a huge stressor on the body, which can tax those adrenal glands. I want you to know about eating the right fats as well, because today's modern diet and general medical opinion is that eating less fat and eating more carbohydrates has caused an epidemic in obesity and diabetes. Our bodies actually need fat, but it has to be the right kind of fat. I mean, as I mentioned already, some of the bad ones are very commonly used day to day by people in their own homes but also, especially if you go out to eat in restaurants, they're almost always using the bad fat. So really be aware of that and where you're eating and your food sources. Some good healthy fats are extra virgin olive oil. And of course, I'm always a proponent of always getting organic. And olive oil is also best if it's cold pressed. Uh, avocado oil is good. Uh, coconut oil is excellent. Coconut oil is actually antibacterial and antiviral, and it doesn't change to the bad type of fat when it's placed at high heat, which many others can be. Uh, so it's a, a great oil to use for a lot of purposes. And then remember that all carbohydrate, the carbohydrates are going to turn to sugar in the body. So a lot of people say, well, you know, Karen, I have had my child on a gluten-free and casein-free diet for a long time, but you know, they're still having a lot of gut issues. Well, as you've heard me, of course, talk before about other things like the mold biotoxins and glyphosate and Lyme, other things that disrupt the gut and keep it ill. On top of that, you want to make sure that you are also removing processed carbohydrates. You know, these gluten-free sources don't mean they're healthy. So, I mean, they're better than having the gluten in there, but you're also wanting to know that uh, things like tapioca and or potato starches that, you know, that are used in these gluten-free sources are not good because those carbohydrates, those processed carbohydrates are turning to sugar in the body and they will feed the candida in the body, which is the pathogenic bad bacteria, which we'll talk a little bit more here in it about here in a moment. I also want you to know that I have uh, my free food guide is available um, at naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash seven foods. Uh, and I'll link to it in the show notes as well, because you might be wanting a, a good list of, well, what should I not be eating for sure? And also knowing why, because I think the more education you have around something like that, it's the the more that you feel the the, the knowledge helps you to remember and to make sure you know that those are the reasons why and, and you have those concerns so you know, hey, this isn't something I wanna eat or feed to my child. Um, so those processed carbohydrates also will turn into uh, belly fat or fat around the waistline. And the real health problem in that case is that those fats are depositing around those internal organs and those arteries that go to your heart. So this is very important for people to understand. Now we're going to talk a little bit about candida issues. Our lovely friend Candida, always there. <laughs> we try to get away from it, but uh, our you know all kids with autism have candida overgrowth. And uh, I'll link to an episode that I did specifically on candida, so you can learn more about it as well. But it's commonly known as yeast, of course, and can become overgrown in the gut. And when this happens, it not only affects the health of our gut and the immune system and the brain, but our blood sugar as well. So it, it feeds on carbohydrates and sugars. So we, we actually are craving carbohydrates and you might see that in your child, especially with autism, they crave carbohydrates and they want them more than anything. And gluten and casein, just as a side note here, the proteins in dairy and wheat, actually have op create opiates in the body, just like an opiate drug. 
So they literally make us crave that even more. But the sugars are really craved by the candida, which uses it as its food supply. So not only are straight sugars uh, uh, becoming a food supply for these candida, but also um, dairy has a lot of sugar in it and then wheat products as well, but any processed carbohydrates. So uh, you might be noticing again that your child just literally is craving these things. And it's because of these literal addictions and these candida bugs require them for food. So it's important that to know that candida also is a factor in leaky gut. Now it allows those undigested food particles to also enter the bloodstream, causing more inflammation and food allergies as again, as I mentioned earlier. So they bore holes in the lining of the intestine. So we need to get that overgrowth in balance. They also will crowd out the good bacteria and have the bad in there, causing further problems of inflammation and that the gut directly does affect the ability of the brain to function. Very, very important to know that. Enzyme production decreases this bloat, the bloating increases, and it all triggers an immune response that alerts the adrenals to affect their own response. Then because the lining of the gut's damaged, it's not properly absorbing also those vital nutrients from the foods that we are eating. When the, you might notice that your child is, is eating a lot of food, but then they're, they're hungry all the time. They don't have satiety uh, uh, or they're trying, they're mouthing, they're trying to mouth things because they're, they're looking for a way to get the nutrition in as a little side caveat with uh, you, that's more nail biting and that has to do with parasites, which can, of course, also disrupt the gut and the, the health. But uh, that's a whole, a whole separate episode on that one and very important. But we can become malnourished even though we're eating and then we remain hungry and our body and brain are starving for nutrition. Candida can also eat up all the glucose, leaving the brain starving for it. And this can easily happen at night when we're sleeping because we're not eating. So basically we're fasting when we sleep. The body, the, the, the food that the body has is eaten up. The glucose is eaten up by the candida and the brain needs glucose to function. So it wakes us up to try to get us to eat. So this is kind of that can be often that 3 a.m. somewhere eight, waking up between 1 and 3 a.m. This can be very common for as one of those reasons. And I've done an episode uh, calling, talking specifically about candida-induced hypoglycemia, which I will be leading, linking to again in today's uh, show notes for you. Leptin issues. Leptin is the main hormone that regulates both appetite and weight loss by telling your brain when to eat and how much to eat. And mainly it tells your body when to burn fat and when not to. And when leptin sensitivity is balanced, you won't stop storing excess fat or you'll, you will stop storing excess fat. It controls hunger and food cravings, and um, you can also have trouble losing weight normally. So cutting down on calories is, actual, is an actual diet of long-term self-defeat. It can make things worse because your body is recognizing that it has less calories so it can start to hold on to that leptin, making you more leptin resistant, telling your body not to burn fat and sugar and just basically to hang on to everything it's got. So it tells our body basically it's starving first, further in balancing that leptin and it keeps us fat. Sugar, of course, causes stress. We're not meant to use sugar as our primary fuel. This comes from a triggered stress response that causes our fat burning hormone leptin to become imbalanced and leptin is produced by our fat cells and you can become resistant, resistant again over time. And it's really, really common. The body can be put into a stress re response from factors such as improper diet, inflammation, food allergies, stressful environmental factors, toxins, or a brain imbalance that triggers ongoing anxiety. When, th when this happens, adrenaline is released and this cont contracts, contracts your blood vessels, 
which deplete the cells of water, sugar, and the much needed nutrients. A lack of nutrients then causes a feeling of excessive hunger. And this again signals the brain to come, uh, which comes from the hormone leptin. There are some things we can do with brain support here. Serotonin, which is the, you know, I call it the, the king of neurotransmitters or brain messengers. And it helps regulate things like mood, sleep, and satiety of appetite. And it's commonly depleted in many individuals, especially in children on the autism spectrum. Serotonin's receptors are in the gut. And if the digestive tract is unhealthy, which it often is in our kids, then these receptors can't provide enough serotonin to the brain. So this can cause trouble with sleep, mood swings, and appetite that is insatiable. Mm -hmm. Anxiety is also common with an unhealthy gut. And another caveat here is that histamine intolerance can also be a strong culprit. And I will link to more information on that for you in the show notes as well, because it was a whole episode on its own. And it's so important to know that the histamine high foods and triggers in our environment can cause a lot of anxiety and, uh, and might be something that's hidden that your, that your child's eating or being exposed to in their environment that you're not aware of. So now it's time for some solutions. So what can you do? <laughs> you can eat plenty of good food. It's okay to eat. Just eat the right ones. A lot of people think to lose weight, they need to starve themselves. Well, we've already talked about how that doesn't work and how it really is self-defeating. So eat food, but, but you want to eat the right foods, of course. So protein sources in moderation combined with lots of good fats. Yes, good fats are very, very important to eat. Our brain is actually made up of 60% fat. So you want to be feeding it the good fat. It also has so many other healthy antioxidant factors in the body that it can lead to the body. And um, same thing with uh, non-starchy vegetables. So some of the good fats, again, are avocado, extra virgin, olive oil, organic, cold uh, coconut oil, and uh, nuts are really good too, but not peanuts. Peanuts are not a nut. They're a legume. They're inflammatory and they can cause a lot of other issues. They often carry mold too. But nuts like macadamia nuts and almonds are uh, can be very, very a very good source. You're all uh, to also keep you satiated because they have that protein and good fat combined. So that can be really helpful for you. They're a great snack to carry around to keep yourself from getting overly hungry or from your blood sugar tanking because you've waited too long to eat. That's another thing is you don't, you want to keep it stabilized. Um, waiting past your levels of hunger can be really hard on your body, those blood sugar spikes. Um, and if you want to balance leptin, it takes about 21 days to rebalance your leptin levels. And um, this is basically by, you know, cutting out the sugars and the carbohydrates uh, at a, at a pretty strict level to, to get them back in balance. But after this time, you can eat foods, not on the diet, but within moderation. Now, once leptin is balanced, you should continue to maintain your weight. Some meal examples are, may say like eggs with avocado or chicken with green salad and olive oil on it, because then again, you're getting the, the oil in with the protein. Um, you can, again, adding uh, certain nuts maintain a reduction or elimination of bad starchy carbohydrates. Of course, cereal, cookies, crackers, um, sugar, definitely not sugar, especially white sugar. And I'll give you a couple of, of uh, pieces of, of, of healthy and safe sugar substitutes because there are a lot of bad ones out there. You also want to avoid, again, bad fats. We mentioned monosodium glutamate, bad sugar substitutes like aspartame and sucralose. Those are both really bad. As you detoxify, it will be important to support your liver. Supplementing with uh, things like maybe milk thistle, uh, there are other things that we can do to detoxify the liver um, to help support it. And of course, you know, toxin binders as we're working with this as well because we, we need to sop up the extra toxins that begin getting released as we're beginning to 
um, uh, starve out that candida. And when they die, you can get some die off reactions if there's too much uh, toxins backing up in the body that, the, that your child's body or yours can't excrete fast enough. And that's when you can see some worsened behavior. So those are things to be, be knowing that can be very helpful as well. Uh, uh, and now, uh, normally a probiotic can be helpful in, uh, in working with the gut as well. In it, those members that, that are here listening know that I, I usually wait in adding in the probiotic in, in, the, in my membership program, we do it in module two. And the reason for that is mm -hmm. that a good probiotic, again, a quality one, because there's a lot of bad ones out there, a quality one that uh, that is uh, going to help maintain some balance, it, even though it's a, a quality product, it can in the beginning if, uh, start, it will help to kill off the, the candida because it's bringing in the good bacterial strains that we need for our gut health and our brain health. But when it does that, it kills, it crowds out the candida, the bad bacteria, which is what we want. But again, as I just mentioned, if that happens too quickly or too soon before your child's detox pathways and liver are supported well enough, then it can cause some really heightened behaviors. So sometimes I don't want to throw that in right away. Uh, just because we want to, again, support those detox pathways uh, with some toxin binders and support the liver as well before you really start moving on to, um, you know, some, some further things that can help really build the good bacteria that are eventually definitely needed. Uh, if fatigue or hair loss or you have really cold hands and feet and weight gain are concerns that you notice a lot, then these are common symptoms of thyroid levels that are uh, out of balance. And you're, you can get those tested by a healthcare practitioner, but I want you to know that it's important to get a saliva adrenal test. It's extremely helpful because one can be done through any natural healthcare practitioner, even a chiropractor can order the test for you. And I'll, I'll uh, link to a company in the show notes that has a good one, um, to know, because what I want you to know is you want the test that measures saliva at four different times a day. And uh, it's a saliva test again, but what happens is it measures those cortisol levels at different increments during the day, because you don't want to only measure one time a day, which is common to do um, a lot of, a lot of practitioners that are less knowing we'll use maybe a urine test that you just do once. Well, that's only measuring one increment in a day and that's not how you wanna measure, so, uh, measure from cortisol levels because they fluctuate up and down through the day. It should be done, the saliva test is more accurate and you want the one that's done four times a day. Uh, and it can be done at, you know, at, at home or at work because it's pretty easy and it is more accurate than blood testing up to 92 to 96 percent and it's less invasive of course than a blood draw and more affordable actually and the adrenal test that i'm going to link to is the company is diagnostex uh, and they actually have this adrenal saliva test that's measuring for your adrenals but it also at the same time because it's so much influenced by it it measures your gliadin levels which are your gluten tolerance levels so that can be an extra little bonus uh, for getting that done as well. Most conventional doctors will measure blood or urine, which, you know, again, gives you a one-time increment and it's really just far less accurate than the saliva testing. And blood tests will also allow for false results. So you want to know more in depth on saliva taste testing. I'll link to this in the show notes. And again, you can ask any practitioner that you're seeing of any kind uh, to purchase that particular test for you if you're wanting to do one. And um, and uh, if they, but many of the natural practitioners will will often carry them in their office as well. As I mentioned, serotonin, that king of neurotransmitters or brain messengers, and I'll link to a show note that I a show that I did on neurotransmitters if you'd like to learn more which I think is very important for children of autism to know, or parents of children of autism to know. 
uh, that serotonin is responsible again for things like regulating sleep, appetite, and mood regulation. And you want to, again, possibly ask a practitioner, there's a natural supplement called 5-HTP that builds serotonin levels. And you don't want to take that. It works so well that you uh, don't want to take it if you're already taking psychotropic prescription drugs. Um, and remember that natural supplementation can take up to about three weeks to really uh, kick in. You want to take them the right way. 5-HTP needs to be taken away from food. And uh, I often suggest taking uh, a dosage in the morning, a dosage in the evening, but I just want you to be aware of it right now. So 5-HTP is helpful to build serotonin levels naturally and safely. Um, also great for people who, who happen to have depression. Uh, magnesium also um, is good to take daily um, because low levels of magnesium can cause leptin and insulin resistance. And most of us are deficient in magnesium. Now I have to be responsible here again and tell you that magnesium should cause uh, calming. It's a relaxing, it, it has, it's responsible for over 400 uh, enzymatic reactions in the body and so many other things. But if you start your child on magnesium and they get hyperactive, which is the opposite of what magnesium would normally do, then it means their sulfation levels, which I will link to a show note that I uh, did a podcast I did on sulfation, where I interviewed MIT professor, Dr. Stephanie Seneff on it. Um, sulfation is another kind of a, a simplest way of saying it would be uh, their detox pathways are not working properly. And this helps by going through again, the whole diet detoxification, clearing up the pathogens, the co-infections. Uh, hopefully you know about all of my four stages that I completely cover in my membership program, but the four stages to naturally recover from the symptoms of autism, they all have to be dealt with properly. And by doing that, it helps those sulfation levels and it helps the, uh, the levels of um, detox, the detox pathways to clear and, and all of those things to be able to take in nutrients like magnesium that it needs. So I just wanted to say that magnesium is often very, very helpful for leptin and insulin resistance, but I didn't want to just say that if you, you haven't been listening to me for a while, or you're not in my program and you think, okay, I'll just give my child some magnesium. And then your child becomes really hyperactive and you're thinking, what happened? So I just wanted you to be aware of that and always start with very, very small, low increments of something and then slowly move up uh, in dosages over time, something like that. And just watch for symptoms right now. Chromium picolinate is a mineral that is helpful in balancing blood glucose levels, reducing hunger cravings and improves the metabolism of carbohydrates. And it can be extremely helpful with sugar cravings. Ubiquinol, which is the active form of CoQ10 and also really helpful for mitochondria, uh, which I will link to in a show that I did on mitochondria. Very, very important to know for children with autism for so many reasons, um, but it also helps support those detox pathways and it decreases blood glucose levels by over 30% increases metabolism, increases energy. That's what the, the energy comes from that mitochondria need. And it's an antioxidant and it increases the levels of glutathione inside the cells. And glutathione is the body's master antioxidant in our, our kids with autism because of they're so toxic. Those uh, glutathione levels have been diminished. And if the liver is not working well, then it can't make more glutathione. So it's kind of like that, you know, double-edged sword there. Zinc is also helpful to stabilize insulin and, uh, and it also is helpful um, in detoxification as well. It's important when taking any natural supplements to be sure they are quality suppl supplements also for effective results. Uh, there are a lot of really poor and subpar products out on the market. So make sure you're getting something quality and then it does not have any bad fillers in it. You don't want any maltodextrins or glu gluten or soy or dairy. You know, there are some bad fillers that they'll put in those. So 
go to a, a quality health food store. Uh, if you don't know what to purchase, ask for help. Um, make sure that you're, um, you know, you know, you're getting something that 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 is right. Uh, making sure that it's of quality. Uh, lastly, I did say I would give you some options for, uh, you know, things to help with baking. I think are really helpful. Or a safe. There are two safe natural sweeteners. One is stevia. I always say organic green leaf, but organic or at least without the bad fillers. Some of some of them have like again maltodextrin or dextrose in those. Do not eat those. They if it ends in O S E like sucrose, which means sugar, they are a form of sugar. So just remember that O S E. It's a chemical composition name for the end of a word, meaning it contains sugar in it. So Again, back to safe and natural, you've got stevia without any bad fillers in it and monk fruit. Monk fruit is uh, also something, these two, stevia and monk fruit don't affect blood glucose levels. They don't feed the candida uh, and they're, they're natural and they're safe. Uh, and monk fruit can be really helpful as a substitute in baking, especially in a one-to-one -one ratio exchange. Like say that a recipe calls for half a cup of sugar. Well, instead of a half a cup of sugar, you put in a half a cup of monk fruit and it then you get the sweetness out of it without the sugar. And the same with uh, coconut flour, which is actually my go-to for a, a wheat substitute uh, in baking. Coconut flour or almond flour are also good substitutes for wheat flour in any recipe. Again, that ratio same is about one to one. You can play with it, just vary it slightly how much so you get the consistency you want in any uh, any baking good that you're making at home. But those are just something I wanted to share with you uh, so that you knew that there were some additional options and things, you know, when you're baking at home by yourself. And then I also, of course, have my free, you know, getting started cheat sheet, cheat sheet the, uh, the top seven foods to avoid which I will link to again on the show notes, which will be at naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash 163. Um, and my free foods guide will be linked to there as well. But the link is naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash seven foods. And that's just the number seven and foods with no spaces in between. So I hope this episode has been helpful for you and helps you on your journey uh, to natural and safe recovery from the symptoms of autism. And really overall, what we're doing is we're improving health. We are really wanting to get the body to its optimum health. And so we have longevity for our children and ourselves. And when we're healthier, our brain is happier and our outlook on life is happier. So we're happier and healthier. And we want our kids also to have that more fulfilling life that they deserve as well. And for you too, as a lovely parent that you are proactive, getting the resources you need to help your children. And I appreciate what you're doing. And thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Take care and we'll see you soon.